welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James. Welcome to episode 40 of the Madden America podcast. This week, I'm really pleased to have been able to chat with Laura Delano. And for many of you, Laura needs no introduction as she's internationally known for her activism, education and advocacy work around the mental health system and particularly withdrawal from psychiatric drugs. Laura is co-founder and executive director of the Inner Compass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project, which aim to create safe spaces for people to connect and the opportunity to learn about and be guided through the process of getting beyond the mental health system and off psychiatric drugs. In this interview, we got time to talk about Laura's personal experiences of the mental health system and what led her to co-found the Inner Compass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project. Laura, welcome. Thank you so much for talking with me today for the Mad in America podcast, and I've really been looking forward to chatting with you. So to begin, I wanted to ask if you could perhaps tell us how you first became involved with the mental health system. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to share. And and it's an honor to be on this podcast and to be connecting with you, James. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, yep. Yeah, so I, I spent many years as a patient in the mental health system beginning when I was 13. And, uh, and I left the mental health system at the age of, of 27, which was back in 2010. And um, I, for most of that time, was a very good compliant patient who, you know, did what my doctors suggested, who took medications as prescribed, who, you know, checked herself into the psychiatric hospital and she was having a difficult time. Um, and, and I look back and I see that really being, you know, quote unquote, mentally ill and particularly bipolar, that was the main label I had. It became um, my career and really my identity. And, and I got quite good at it. And um, it really was the only source of meaning in my life. And to skip over the details of what unfolded in through those years, um, by the time 2010 came around, and, and there I was, 27 years old, on five medications. I'd spent the previous decade just progressively getting worse, um, becoming increasingly more unable to participate in life, being physically sick a lot, chronic pain, chronic um, headaches, like mental and cognitive issues, emotional instability, just getting progressively worse and worse and worse, I happened upon a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, which I know you're well aware of, of course, uh, written by Robert Whitaker, founder of Mad America. And I miraculously read it, which really was nearly impossible being on five medications you know, to read anything. And it, it just, it was a profound aha moment for me and in which I realized, you know, what if all of these years in which I've been thinking of myself as having this, you know, so-called serious mental illness. Um, what if really this treatment I've been turning to for help has been progressively disabling me. Hmm. And so that began my, my journey out of the mental health system. And it was really driven by um, primarily curiosity. Like if this is true, you know, who could I be off of these meds? You know, of course I was also angry and I went through, very intense grief and confusion and much else. But yes, curiosity, I would say, was kind of the driving force behind what led me to decide to come off medications. And so I did so without any understanding of psychiatric drug withdrawal. I, I didn't, I don't think I even knew it was a thing. Like I just, I was so determined to get these drugs out of my system as fast as possible. That was how I was thinking about it. And, um, my psychiatrist on my treatment team at the program I was, I was in full time, um, cause I couldn't work at that point was not supportive at all of my decision to come off. And he, you know, just basically said, if, you know, if you're going to insist on doing it, I, I guess, I'll let you, but this is not going to go well. And so, yeah, that began my, my journey off the meds. And mm -hmm. this was, yeah, back in, in 2010. And, and since that time, I've basically, basically um, spent almost every waking moment of my life just deeply passionate about 
my own process of, of like rediscovering myself and also more broadly helping others find their way back to themselves after being medicated and, and psychiatrized. And, and um, yeah, the, it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life coming off of five psychiatric drugs and they were lithium, Lamictal, Abilify, Effexor, and Ativan was mm. what I was on it at the end. Um, it, I'm seven and a half years off now and there's still aspects of, of my body that I can tell are, are very much healing, like my gut. And, um, I think even my, you know, my stress response is, is still healing. It's been a long, long journey, but boy, has it been like so meaningful and exciting. And, um, I feel very grateful for it too now. And, and, uh, yeah, I could go on and on about it, but (laughs) maybe I'll stop there. Well, Laura, personally, it's incredibly valuable for someone like me to speak to someone with your experiences because I'm still withdrawing. I'm halfway through the process and it's the single most challenging, most grueling thing that I've ever experienced. But to get to speak to people who have come out the other side and can look back and say, I'm so much better now, that's so empowering. And Laura, I wanted to ask, you mentioned you were on five medications and then you read Anatomy of an Epidemic. And you described some of the emotions you experienced on reading that book, but it must have been deeply shocking to find out that much of what you've been told by your psychiatrist and your treatment team was not actually sound science or based on evidence. So I just wondered how you felt about that realization. Yeah, I mean, it was very, very traumatic to have in this, you know, quite acute way, just everything you've come to believe in turned on its head. And I I definitely went through different stages of processing it. You know, at first I didn't really, I couldn't believe it. You know, this can't be true because like every single facet of my being was inextricably bound up in being mentally ill and needing medications and needing to, you know, go to therapy and go to the hospital and this and that. I mean, my whole world revolved around, around this. And the way I made sense of my emotional pain, which was very profound, you know, this, I, I was in tremendous, very prolonged pain for mm. many, many years. Um, you know, I, I made sense of it in this very medicalized way and had for so many years. So to suddenly have that narrative uprooted, you know, that, that my intense highs and lows and just the overwhelming urge to die that I felt and, an ability to slow my mind down and to just feel peace of mind, you know, that these, what do you mean? These aren't symptoms of an illness in my brain. Um, It it just, that narrative of, of, you know, the medicalized narrative, it really meant a lot to me for a long time because it helped me a feel like this isn't my fault. You know, there's, I'm just, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a weak person. I'm just a sick person. And B, uh, it it helped me feel taken care of because I had tried for so long to, you know, rid myself of my emotional pain on my own, but to no avail. And so to think of it as, you know, these are just symptoms of an illness. You know, the next step is to say, and all I need to do is get treatment and turn to professionals to help me. And so it, I, I felt, you know, a sense of relief that I'll be taken care of you know, eventually. And of course that never actually happened. I never felt helped really like at all, but I just, that faith that I had um, in doctors and in the mental health system, it was very strong. And so, yeah, to have that all called into question was so disorienting and uprooting. And I think after I got through that phase of denial, then the next, you know, the next phase I think I moved into was just profound despair Hmm. and, grief really because I I realized I'd lost some of the most important years of my life you know my teenage and 20 something years which are the years you're meant to figure out who you are and how to fit in into the world and how to build relationships and how to you know be in relationship to your own body and sexuality and creativity and all of these things and I realized oh my god I've been robbed I've had all of this taken away from me and so for a period of time 
I really had to grieve that. And I did feel like a victim, you know, and I, and I think I needed to be in that place for a time. Um, but eventually I did realize that the more I thought of myself as a victim, the, the deeper my emotional dependency was becoming on the mental health system. You know, I wasn't its patient anymore. Now I was its victim. And if I really wanted to feel free from that, I had to move beyond thinking of myself as a victim. And, and at that point I, I began to feel more kind of anger and outrage at a broader level at what it means for our society that, you know, that what happened to me has been happening to so many people and we need to do something about it and take action. And so for a period of time, then outrage kind of drove me and, and I still feel outrage today, but I'd say, um, I, I feel an, I channel it in a much more constructive way than maybe I did a few years ago. Um, and I'd say eventually I did move into this place of just of gratitude and excitement because as the years passed and I, and I healed more and more, and I should say that about three years off of medications was when I began to just come alive. Hmm. Like that just was a huge, between years three and four off, a lot began to happen then in, in terms of healing. Suddenly it was just this every day I just, I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh my gosh, what, what's going to, what am I going to feel today? Or what kind of healing is going to happen today? And I just began to feel this deepening appreciation for the fact that I had this second chance um, at being alive. And then I should say every step of the way, I was incredibly lucky and privileged to have a lot of support around me so that. I could continue on month after month and year after year healing and not many people, you know, there are many people who don't have the support of family and friends and the ability to take a break from work and to be taken care of. I had a lot and I, and I believe that that is in large part why I was able to heal in the way that I've, I've healed and, of course, that's something that needs to change at a broader level. How do we make sure everyone who wants to come off of these drugs gets access to what they need? It's always, it feels important to always say that because it's such a big part of my story is the support that I had. Absolutely. Well, again, it's wonderful to hear you describe that process of healing and how that desire to help others led to your activism, which is how I came to know of your work. I know that you've talked before about how we might move beyond the way that we currently try to help and support people who might be struggling. So I just wondered if we could talk a little about how we could do things differently in future. I had such a big and important question, and I, I definitely don't think I have the answers to it, but a part of, a part of me feels that we, we're not meant to know what it, a different way looks like necessarily in advance that we're going to figure it out together and that it really starts I think with um, an internal shift within us in the way we make sense of our emotional pain and you know the, these ideas of normal and crazy and how we define the, these terms and who defines them and how you know power and profit play into all of these narratives. And, and I, so I think in these early stages of this kind of movement away from the medical model of, you know, mental illness and mental health and the uh, movement away from the, this idea that only professionals and doctors and experts can address emotional suffering. I think it really does start with all of us together, stepping back to reflect on, the stories we tell ourselves about what it means to be human. And I, I also think that if we're going to move beyond the mental health system, which for me really looks like not necessarily fighting against the system that's currently in place, but helping people realize they don't need the system, that there are other, other ways, other places they can turn I think really this is all going to start at the local level. I don't think the answer is to come up with some giant new system or, um, you know, a huge high level solution. It's, I think it's really about helping people in their neighborhoods and local communities reconnect with each other 
uh, reconnect with their own capacities to help each other and, you know, begin the process of kind of creating very local spaces, like physical spaces where people can come together and talk about these ideas, support one another. Um, that, that to me is how this is, is where I really believe the answers lie. And that's definitely what I'm really passionate about in my own work is helping people realize how much power they have within them as individuals and between them as, as neighbors and fellows. And so I'm, I'm, I'm quite fired up about, you know, this idea of like, how do we all find each other, like literally in person in our communities to meet up at the local coffee shop or to go for a walk or to go over to each other's houses for a potluck dinner. I mean, these very simple um, ideas to me can have very profound and transformative effects because I think most people, and I would guess that most people end up in the mental health system because they don't know where else to turn. And so we have to actually build alternative spaces that people can turn to um, so that slowly over time, this, our, our dependency on the mental health system or our reliance on it will just dissipate. And I think it's going to take generations of work. I don't think this is going to happen overnight, but I really believe it's possible that like in generations down the road, people will look back and say, my God, you remember, I mean, this history book I just read of when, when society believed that doctors had the answers to emotional pain and that a little pill was going to fix you. My God, fascinating that they once thought that. <laughs> like, I think we will get there. But we have a long way to go. Yeah, we do. And again, in my own personal journey, I also went through that time where I suddenly realized how arrogant it was for a doctor to tell me they knew my mind better than I did. And it took me quite a while to get up the courage to admit that I knew what was right for me. And all I was doing by participating in their system was playing by their rules. But we're complex creatures, aren't we? And who really knows what normal is? Oh, I love, I, I so appreciate you saying that, James. And yeah, this idea of, you know, the expert. And um, I, I just, it, it, I'm right there with you in like having once completely surrendered my agency and my sense of self and, you know, everything really to these, these doctors who didn't know me. They didn't know anything about me, what had happened to me. They just had studied a bunch of textbooks in medical school and saw me as this list of symptoms and yeah, that I gave them that power. And, and I see now that I think I did because I was just terrified of my pain. And, and I think that's, fear I, I had of my of my mind and my emotional pain was largely fueled by the society I grew up in that taught me in all these different ways that, you know, if you're having a hard time, if you're thinking about death, if you're grappling with racing thoughts that keep you up at night about the, you know, the meaning of life and, and, you know, you, you feel great despair that there's something wrong with you. And, your mind is dangerous and you can't trust in yourself. And, and I completely swallowed that, you know, hook, line and sinker. And that fear is what led me into the arms of the mental health system. And to get out of the mental health system, I had to find the readiness to let go of that fear and learn how to be with my mind and my pain again, because I still, you know, it's not like life is hunky dory today and everything's great. Like I feel great pain often on a, you know, on a daily basis, I cry a lot. I feel overwhelming angst about many things. I'm, I think constantly about the state of the world that we're in and, you know, many things that would get me labeled sick, but I'm just not afraid of it anymore. And I, I kind of coexist with these, this darkness in me in a very different way. And it sounds like you're, you're in the same kind of process yourself. And I think we that we, when we realize that we're all in this together and that we're all kind of reclaiming our, our minds, our sense of self, our emotional pain from the mental health system, you know, it's quite an empowering and exciting thing to me to hmm. think about all of us together doing this. Absolutely, it is. You're right. And Laura, you mentioned there are other places to turn to, and that's important to me too. 
So I wondered if we could talk a little now about your work on the Inner Compass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project, both of which are hugely exciting projects. So I just wondered if you could tell us about the work leading up to this moment and what Inner Compass is aiming to achieve. Sure, I'd, I'd love to share more about this. Um, yeah, so a, a few years ago, um, a small group of us I was given the amazing opportunity to put this nonprofit called Inner Compass Initiative together. We got a seeding grant, and so we had this financial support to make it happen. And really, the vision behind the vision at the heart of Inner Compass Initiative is this future beyond the mental health system of kind of relocalized communities who are who've taken back their power really from, from the mental health industry. And of course it's quite a lofty vision. And so uh, the, the, we decided to focus our efforts primarily on the issue of psychiatric drug withdrawal at this early stage in our evolution as an organization, because of course, as you well know, there's such a dire need for um, freely accessible information on you know how to taper off psychiatric drugs as carefully as possible, you know coping tips for for when you're facing withdrawal symptoms, you know imp- trustworthy information, um, not just about how to come off of these drugs, but just about the drugs themselves, you know, because none of us, in my opinion, are making informed choices about these drugs because we've been very betrayed by various industries um, who've kind of fed us this narrative about them that isn't rooted in in actual evidence. Um, So, yeah, so our focus, the InterCompass Initiative's focus right now is on the withdrawal project. Hmm. Um, So we've built uh, this website devoted to PWP, the withdrawal project, and it has uh, extensive, extensive information there, all freely accessible, on issues like psychiatric drug dependence and tolerance um, so that people can better understand how these drugs actually affect the central nervous system and what that means for trying to come off of them. And we have resources on withdrawal itself. You know, what does it look like? How long does it typically last for? And of course, these questions don't have discrete answers because it looks very different um, depending on who you are and how long you've been on the drugs for. But um, yeah, beyond that information, we've written a a detailed step-by-step manual to coming off that we call our companion guide to psychiatric drug withdrawal. And um, it's a two-part manual. And the first part we call prepare. And it basically walks you through various steps you can take to effectively prepare yourself for the withdrawal journey. So you know, thinking about your beliefs about taking and coming off of these drugs, um, getting informed about psychiatric drug dependence and tolerance, uh, thinking through your support system, your physical health and diet, um, your relationship to your prescriber and how to communicate about withdrawal with your prescriber, you know, v- various different pieces of the puzzle that that many people have found to be helpful in advance of starting a taper And then the second part of our manual is devoted solely to helping people inform themselves about like the nitty gritty details of how lay people are tapering themselves off of these drugs successfully. So we help people learn how to read the FDA drug labels for their medications to determine if they can alter the form of their drug um, because many people have to come off these drugs you know, making using liquid mixtures with syringes and all of these kinds of things. We help people learn about taper rates and schedules and methods. And, you know, we have everything in great detail, right down to pictures of how people are, are tapering off. And the, the piece of the withdrawal project that I'm the most excited about is uh, what we call TWP Connect which is a free networking platform um, where you can be anywhere in the world at any stage of the withdrawal journey. So you might be on medications and undecided about if you even want to come off, you're just thinking about it, or you could be 10 years off of medications. Um, You register and you complete a, a profile that shares a little bit about 
your relationship to these drugs and your taper experience. And then you locate yourself on a map and then you can search for other members based on geographical location and uh, personal experience with medications and interests and needs. So you could say, I want to find someone within five miles of London who's, you know, more than two years off of medications and you can filter. And then all the members who meet that, those criteria show up and then you can contact them one-on-one. So we don't have any forums. We don't have any chat rooms. It's, it's right at this stage, it's just one-on-one connecting. But this to me is a, is a mechanism of helping people find each other locally. It's why we've built it because right now I'm sure within, you know, a thousand feet of where I'm sitting, there's at least one other person out there who's had experience taking or coming off of these drugs, but we don't know about each other. We don't know each of us exists. And so this platform can help us find each other. Uh, And we've also built the same platform at the Intercompass Initiative website. And so that platform called ICI Connect is for anyone who's thinking critically about the mental health system has the same technologies. You can find people based on their location and interests. But yeah, this tool I am really excited about because I think it's, it's, it will hopefully help people find each other. And from there, then they can start organizing. And, and we anticipate helping people do that in the months and years to come by creating you know, organizing resources, like helping people set up support groups, discussion groups, film screenings, events, um, helping, you know, organizations build withdrawal infrastructure, you know, mental health organizations. So, like we see ourselves as, as a support organization um, aimed at helping people in their own communities build what they want to build. Mm. Uh, that's really how we, we see ourselves working in the future yeah absolutely and i just want to say that from spending time looking at the website and reading the information i think laura you and your colleagues have done an incredible job i think it's beautifully presented in a non-medical way and it's a welcoming space which is so important i'm sure you know yourself laura that being in withdrawal if you look online there's a mass of information out there and much of it is conflicting the medical information tells you you shouldn't be having a problem, while some of the personal accounts can be quite raw and scary for people. But the space that you've created is welcoming, and I know myself how isolating withdrawal can be and how important it is to connect people. So I think your work on this is magnificent. Oh, thanks so much, James. I, I That feedback, I really appreciate hearing that. And, and you're right about just how confusing and terrifying the process can be to try to inform yourself about these issues. And that is a big part of why we wanted to create this hub where you can kind of find everything you need in one place. And, and, and yes, we try to convey it in as accessible a way as possible. I mean, there's a lot of information there. And so I imagine that some people find themselves a bit overwhelmed by how much we have there, but that was our hope is that we could create a welcoming supportive space that, that is both, you know, really clear about just the risks involved in coming off, but also that's full of hope and inspiration because having been doing this work for nearly eight years at this point and looking at my own journey, I'm just, I feel so deeply that we heal from this. You know, there is a lot of hopelessness and despair out there in the withdrawal community, which is totally understandable because it's an agonizing and very terrifying experience. Uh, But but people really do find themselves overwhelmed by hopelessness at points. And we want to convey the message that we heal. It, It takes, for some people, it takes longer than for others, but the central nervous system and the, and the human body are just such resilient beings <laughs> and, and we do heal. And the more that, like you said, you know, the more we can transcend that alienation and isolation that is so rampant um, and, and the more we can find each other and be there for each other um, to mentor and to support one another. I think the, the greater you know, the hope will, will people can feel. And that's the message that I just want to shout from the rooftops, you know, don't give up hope no matter in how much pain you're in. 
um, how, what messages you've, you've read or been told, you know, people do heal from psychiatric drugs, from withdrawal, from, you know, they, they heal and we need to spread that message far and wide. We do. And Laura, you reminded me while you were talking there, one of the things on the Inner Compass initiative that really spoke to me was the emphasis put on the need to unlearn what we know. And I think that's important because I feel that I was indoctrinated by medical explanations like the chemical imbalance and all the other things we're told to justify treatment. So the need to unlearn really struck a chord with me. And I wondered if that was a conscious thing for you. It, it was. And I, I love the notion of unlearning and yeah, and at this at this point, what we have on the Inner Compass Initiative website is this section that, as you pointed out, that we call learn slash unlearn. Mm. And um, yes, because while most of what we've been working on is over at the Withdrawal Project website, um, we knew that we needed to create some good, solid, basic information about psychiatric drugs and psychiatric diagnoses that can help people take back their power and their right to be informed and that really it is about unlearning stories we've, we've been told. And um, I mean, just layers upon layers of, of stories about, you know, the chemical imbalance theory and, you know, the expertise of psychiatrists and the safety and effectiveness of these drugs. And so our, yeah, our hope is that this section of our, our website over at ICI, which, will be expanding over time um, can serve as a, as a resource for self-education and for, for critical thinking and um, for just curious exploration and reflection on, you know, like what are the stories that we've come to believe about, about our minds, about our pain, about these drugs and, um, and how do we get the information we need to actually decide for ourselves, like what resonates with us and what maybe isn't actually serving us as well as we thought. So I'm I, that's cool to hear that you resonated with that. Cause yes, this idea of unlearning is one that excites me a lot and that I'm still very much in the process of myself. I think it's a lifelong thing for mm. sure. Yes, it is. And also I wanted to mention that the withdrawal project was mentioned recently in the New York Times, wasn't it? So for people listening, the New York Times ran quite a detailed article on people's experiences with withdrawal from antidepressants. And maybe a year or two ago, people reading that article might not have known where to turn. But the article actually recommended that people visit the withdrawal project. So Again, I think you've provided a safe space for people to go to, and I'm guessing that there was quite a bit of interest that arose from that piece. Oh, yes, it's been it's been a real whirlwind. I feel like I say I've said the word whirlwind like thousands of times in the last several weeks because it it it's, it's just it was such it was such exciting it was such an exciting time when the article came out and and yes, we've had many many people come to our site, our analytics shot through the roof. We've had several hundred new people join our connect platform, um, both TWP connect and ICI connect, which has been great to see. And just reading through the member registrations and hearing people or reading people's stories and seeing the commonalities. Um, it's, it's been, you know, it's simultaneously, very painful to read, but it's also really um, exciting to see just like how universal so so many, you know, so much of this is and that we really can, like we're, we're so far from alone in this. There are so many people grappling with the same questions and struggles and that there's power in numbers. And so I'm, I'm just, it's been really wonderful to, to get all these new people involved with us and um, and we've been contacted by many other journalists, you know, like radio, print, podcasts. I have some interviews coming up in the next week. The awareness seems to be continuing to spread. I think the Times article definitely opened up a door um, that maybe wasn't open before, at least at, at the mainstream media level. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's been 
it's been really exciting. And I think it's we will have a busy year ahead of us for sure. And so, Laura, if someone were listening to this and were thinking of maybe starting on the journey to come off their psychiatric drugs, I just wondered if there was any general advice that you'd give or perhaps how they might start to think about preparing for that process. It's a great question. And I think it's important to, to view the psychiatric drug withdrawal journey as starting not with the actual taper, but with, as you said, preparation. Mm-hmm. And I can say from personal experience that not preparing oneself uh, to come off can lead to quite um, agonizing and even disastrous results. Like I had no idea what I was doing when I, when I came off. And so I've learned a lot since about um, what people find helpful in thinking through the decision of whether to come off. And if, if so, like how, how you might do that. And so I think just, recognizing that carving out as much time as needed in advance of starting a taper to really get informed about the drugs that a person is taking and thinking about coming off um, is key. So, and, and I should say that in part one of our companion guide, we break all of this down in great detail. So I guess my first suggestion would be to go to the withdrawal project and start at part one of our companion guide because we provide great detail on all of this. But um, yeah, making time to really learn about the drugs that you're taking, to read the FDA drug label, to better understand their pharmacology, which we help you do on our website. Um, Thinking about just the stories you're telling yourself about these drugs and how they, uh, like the role that they play in your life. Because if you do decide or if the person does decide to leave these drugs behind is going to mean a lot of change. And so really taking the time to reflect on, you know, how do I think of myself in relation to these drugs and what role do these drugs play for me? Um, and what stories do I tell myself about who I am in relation to these drugs? That, that can be helpful. Um, getting informed about drug dependence and understanding the changes that happen in the central nervous system from long-term use of these drugs is really important. And that's really, I think, what helps um, justify the importance of tapering off slowly. Because once you realize that these drugs have, you know, there's a significant chance that they've really altered how your central nervous system functions and how it's, it's structured, you then, it becomes common sense to want to come off of the drug slowly um, because if you rip them away suddenly, it's going to cause havoc to your central nervous system. So yes, getting informed about dependence is is critical. Um, Thinking about the support system you might need and actually trying to build that that system in advance, you know, whether it's family members, friends, a therapist, uh, you know, a faith leader and uh, a teacher, whoever it might be, um, the more time you can spend trying to get people surrounding you who are going to be there by your side as you come off can be really helpful. Um, And I think, of course, as many people fear, um, thinking about if and how you're going to talk to your prescriber about this idea of coming off is important and really taking time to plan that out and think through, you know, how do I want to communicate this to my doctor? What resistance might I anticipate they'll give me? How can I counter that resistance? You know, that, that the more time you spend really preparing yourself in advance of talking to your doctor, the greater the chances that it might go in your favor. Um, And then the last, suggestion I give is to just, uh, you know, spend time thinking about the experiences and and feelings and thoughts and whatever else you've had that led you onto these medications in the first place. Because I definitely found for myself that when I came off of the drugs, I had to return to all of the pain that had led me onto them in the first place. It wasn't like that was gone. And I had to learn how to be with that pain in a different way. And so taking time to really like meditate on, you know, one's relationship to suffering or so-called madness or whatever you want to call it. Um, it can be really 
um, meaningful and important in advance of coming off because the more time you spend like making sense of your pain and, and thinking about it in a different way and preparing yourself to be with it differently, um, chances are that the less fear you'll have down the road, if, if you start to struggle, um, or, or come up against some of the difficulties that maybe you weren't feeling as intensely on the medications. Um, so yeah, that's a long answer and there are many more things I could say, but as literally everything I just shared, we, we talk about on the withdrawal project in part one of the, the companion guide, um, which we call prepare. So yeah, working, working through that, I, I think could maybe be helpful to some. I'm sure it will. And thank you, Laura, for sharing that and for pointing out a resource that people can make use of. Because as you said so eloquently, a large part of the process is the preparation, isn't it? And yet that's the part that many people skip because they just want to get on with it. But preparation is key to success, it feels. It's so important. And I think one of the things that I love talking about is this idea of the speed paradox. You know, I remember being in the place where I just said, I just want these drugs out of my system as fast as possible so that I can like figure out who I am and move on with my life. And so my thinking at the time was, you know, I just want to come off of them fast so that I can get through it fast. And I now see that there's a paradox to all of this and that the faster many, for many people, the faster they come off the longer it actually takes to really heal and reclaim their lives. And so investing much more time up front into preparing, and then of course, investing much more time into tapering slowly, which is what we get into in part two of our guide. It can actually help people get off faster in the long run. And because they've, by the time they've gotten off, like they're actually hanging in there pretty okay. Like they've been able to stay participating in their lives without being debilitated by withdrawal. Whereas people who come off very fast might spend many, many years debilitated. People who come off slow and take all that time um, when they're finished coming off, like they're doing pretty, pretty darn well in, in comparison. So the speed paradox of, you know, the slower you go and the more time you take to prepare, chances are, the journey might end up being faster um, in the in the longer term, if, if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Laura, for people listening who wanted to learn more about the Inner Compass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project, how would they find out more? Yes. Yeah, so we have two separate websites, you know, one for each. So if you, if you're interested in learning more about our nonprofit as a whole, um, you can visit Inner Compass Initiative's website at www.theinnercompass.org. And our website is quite simple at this stage in the game because we focus so much on the withdrawal project, but you'll find, you know, these resources on psychiatric drugs and diagnoses. You'll learn more about our organization and how you can get involved. And you'll, of course, find ICI Connect there. And I hope anyone interested um, will join. It's everything's free and ICI Connect, again, will help you find others in in your local community who are asking questions and thinking critically about the mental health system. Um, And then to visit the Withdrawal Project, you go to withdrawal.theinnercompass.org and you can click on the About tab or you can click on the, um, right on the front page, you'll see kind of a navigation section that will help you find where you want to go on the website based on the questions you have or the needs you have. We again have this companion guide to withdrawal. We have a huge resources section for coping with withdrawal symptoms. Um, We have our learn about withdrawal section and we have our TWP connect platform. And again, I hope, I hope you'll consider joining if you're interested um, and you can contact us at hello at theinnercompass.org if you're interested in learning more about us or getting involved. One of our hopes is that we're going to be getting out there increasingly more uh, to do workshops and trainings 
around withdrawal. So for people interested in potentially bringing us to your community to, to do a workshop um, or, or a talk or something along those lines, um, you know, be in touch. We're eager to help spread our resources and support people who want to get things going in their own communities. Well, as I said, Laura, I just want to thank you really, because there's such a need for this somewhere for people who are desperate for guidance, but like me, because of previous experiences are mistrustful of medical science for you to take your own experiences and creating a compass from that is fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, James. And I just, I'd like to say the same Thanks and return to you for for taking your own experiences and the journey you're on to come off these drugs and you know channel it into the Let's Talk Withdrawal podcast and this podcast and all of the lobbying and advocacy work you're doing over there across the pond. I'm just so appreciative of all that you are doing and others um, in in and around the UK um, to spread awareness about withdrawal and um yeah i think we're really at the forefront of an exciting time you know everyone involved in this and i think the the next 10 years will be quite transformative is what my instincts are telling me (laughs) yeah absolutely i'm sure you're right laura thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today and it's been such a pleasure to hear more about inner compass and the withdrawal project too Thanks, James. So I I really feel the same towards you as well. And yeah, and thank you again for this opportunity to be on the podcast. And it's so great to chat. So I just want to thank Laura for being on the podcast and to remind you that if you want to know more about her work, you can visit the website www.theinnercompass.org. And the Withdrawal Project can be found at withdrawal.theinnercompass.org. So thank you for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.